debate is a very strange activity in that your coach rarely gets to see you actually compete. If you make the breakout rounds and if your coach isn't dragged into judging another team, then yes, you get seen, you get a critique from um, your coach and that can be very useful. But most of the time you are debating in a room full of strangers. You're debating against other debaters. You are debating against um, in front of a judge who is from another school and maybe he writes a good critique. Maybe he or she gives you useful commentary um, or maybe he or she gives you a ballot that says something like, great debate, I voted for the side that was most persuasive. And that's pretty useless. And you've all gotten critiques like that. You have all gotten RFDs that read this way. I've put this together basically listing things I see debaters do over and over again. And there'll be examples here. This is not just you if you are a novice. This is advanced debaters in final rounds that make these mistakes. So learning to recognize these is an important part of improving your skill as a debater, learning to evaluate your own port, your own performance. So you'll notice the Yale logo in the upper corner. The first time I presented this for was Yale runs a summer debate program. Uh, out of their uh, New Haven Urban Debate League. It's available, you can find it on the, Urban, yeah, the New Haven Urban Debate League website. Um, it's not a bad program if you wanna go up to New Haven uh, some summer, the week before school starts, uh, they do a good job. And I've used it uh, for about 10 years since. Years ago, a guy named Sam, Simon Ramo uh, he was an engineer. If you wonder why American rockets don't fall over when they launch them, Simon Ramo is the guy who developed the um, technology to keep a rocket stable when it's going up. If you think about it sitting on a pillar of fire and trying to go straight up in the air is an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, if you doubt that, try balancing an open soda bottle upside down on your hand while the soda is all rushing out. That's basically what the problem is like. But he was a big tennis player. And one of the things he noticed looking at pros because he wanted to become a better pro pro uh, tennis player was that professional tennis players rarely make mistakes. So as a result, they have to win every point. That's why watching pro tennis or any pro sport is so interesting because you watch people who very rarely make mistakes. You see them perform well and they have to win. They have to beat each other. Observing amateurs like himself, however, he found that amateurs generally don't win points. They lose them. In other words, they make a mistake and because of the mistake, they lose the point. So most of the games are not won in the sense of you actively go out and outperform your competitor. Most of them are won because your competitor made more mistakes than you did. And he wrote a book called Extraordinary Tennis for the Ordinary Player. And in it, he talks about an 80-20 rule saying that among pros, they win 80% of the points and their opponent loses them through mistakes about 20% of the time. For amateurs, it's reversed. 80% of the time you win because your opponent made a mistake and only 20% of the time do you win because your shot was a winning shot. Charles Ellis, who was an investment professional, read this book, he was also a tennis player, and he noticed similar things in investments, in gambling, in war. Basically, amateurs make mistakes. And so if you want to win, the best strategy, if you are new at something, is simply observe your own performance and avoid making mistakes. In other words, the team that wins most often is going to be the team that makes the fewest mistakes in the round. So what sort of mistakes do I see debaters make? First one, no plan for the round. Debaters tend, think about your own performance now as you go through this and you listen to me. 
debaters tend to do the same thing over and over again. You come into the tournament and you do just what you did in the last tournament. You go into the next round and you do just what you did in the previous round. You need to start thinking about your behavior, looking at yourself kind of as an outsider and thinking, okay, what did I do? Why did I do it? And is that actually the best way to do things? So what does a plan consist of? A plan consists of a goal. Okay, something simple. I want to win the round. Steps to reach that goal. What do you need to do in order to reach that goal? And benchmarks. How do I measure whether I'm getting there or not? And it can't be something as simple as, well, I won that round, so I must have done well. It's got to be something within the round where you can pace yourself and you can think about what's happening in the round as it goes on. So as you think about how you've debated over the years, as you think about what you do at tournaments, it starts out with the preparation period. Do you have a plan for using that 15 minutes if it's an East Coast tournament, 20 minutes if it's a West Coast tournament, for effectively using the internet if it's a West Coast tournament, or just simply using your own resources if it's an East Coast tournament? Do you have a specific plan as to how you and your partner should work together? Have you discussed it with your partner ahead of time? Have you gone over it? Do you have a plan for each speech? What exactly do you need to do if you are giving the prime minister constructive? What do you need to do if you are giving the member of the opposition constructive? What's your ideal LOR? What's your plan for winning the debate? When you sit there with a topic, what do you need to convince the judge of in order to win the ballot? Okay, plans have to adapt. So I'm not saying that when you develop a plan, you've got a, a way of using prep time, you've got a way of, of dealing with your partner, you've got a way of managing each speech. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have to change it during a round and you have to be aware of that. They're kind of two classic statements. The military saying no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And Mike Tyson, a little bit more graphic. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Okay, you have a plan. You've got a great opposition case. You walk in and the government presents something you didn't expect. You've got to adapt. But in every case, you will be better off if you walk into the room with a good plan to start out. Okay, second mistake debaters make. Failing to find the central issue. What is the debate? What should the debate be about? There's a Greek concept that comes from rhetoric. It's called stasis. It comes from their idea of battle. Basically, Greek battles did not look like the movie 300. It consisted of lines of people with big shields that crashed into each other, and it was a big pushing match. And whoever won that pushing match where the shields came together, whoever broke first would lose. But the idea in a debate is the central issue is going to be something that is not decidable. It's something you can argue about. It's not something that wins for government. It is not something that wins for opposition. If it's something that clearly favors your side, you have not found the central issue. It answers the question, what are you arguing about? If you understand the central issue, it'll provide clarity to the judge and to your opponents, and it'll give you control of the round. If you fail to find the central issue, your opponents may define it, and that's going to work to your disadvantage, almost certainly, or the debate may become muddied or confusing. This is my favorite example of that. This was the final round at Columbia um, just before COVID hit, New Road School versus Hard Horace Mann. This house believes that the sorting hat should be random. Take a minute or two and read through this and tell me who wins this debate and why. One side, based on what you see here, should win this debate nine times out of ten, given to equally able teams. 
Any ideas? As debaters, you've got to be comfortable putting yourself out and not being afraid to give wrong answers. Debaters should be the first one with their hands up to give an answer, even if it's wrong, just to move the conversation along. Anybody? Okay, I was in the room listening to this debate, and as soon as I heard the leader of the opposition give his two contentions, I knew they had lost the debate. If you look at this closely, the government team basically says, the issue here is whether we want to have diversity or we want to have and they don't present it this way, have everybody grouped based on similarity. What's another way for putting everybody who's the same in the same group? Um, I'm not sure, like segregation possibly? Segregation, exactly. In a debate between diversity and segregation, which side do you want to be on? Diversity. Okay. Diversity. The opposition doesn't see what they're doing and they agree to accept that as the central issue. Well, let's debate diversity versus segregation. And while they don't recognize it, they say, look, you know, common skills and ability gives you better education. And their second contention is basically putting all the bad actors, they're thinking of Slytherin House in the same group means that you keep all the bad actors together so you can keep an eye on them. But they're basically arguing in favor of segregation. What should the central issue be? What does opposition do here in order to avoid having to debate in favor of segregation? You're all going to be applying to colleges in a few years. This is exactly the college admission problem. Is it self-selection? Well, not necessarily self-selection, but obviously both sides should be in favor of diversity. Opposition should stand up and say, we agree diversity is the issue, but random okay. selection doesn't necessarily give you a diverse group, whereas if we take into account everybody's characteristics, maybe we can construct a diverse group. I think, Levy, uh, you had your hand up first. Um, is it about free choice? Because I know in the book, at least Harry can sort of like think like not, li not li you know, that he doesn't want to go to Slytherin. And so I feel like that's kind of what it should be about, you know, should you give the people that kind of like measure into what house they will end up into? Well, again, think of it in terms of the college admissions process. Let everybody provide information and then use that information to build diverse groups. This is a big argument right now in front of the Supreme Court. What information can colleges legitimately use in order to obtain the kind of diversity they want in the student body? Rose. So as I, if, is what you're saying that like on off, you should say, like the gov is just arguing that they should be random and we're arguing that they shouldn't be random, not that they should be segregated. No, what you should say is we agree with the government that diversity is the issue. We disagree. What, what we want to argue about is whether the best way to achieve diversity is to use random selection or to consider each student's unique characteristics and then build a diverse class using those characteristics. 
So we don't have all the bad people in Slytherin. We don't have all the heroes in um, Gryffindor. We don't have all the uh, um, sensitive souls in Hufflepuff, and we don't have all the grinds in what was the fourth school. So, but by not seeing what the clear issue was and accepting the choice of government, the opposition puts itself in, in a disadvantage. We don't have time, but I'll leave you with these examples at the end. Um, what I'll do is pop them in the choice for now. We can talk about them later. These are kind of other examples where if you pick the wrong central issue, you're going to be in trouble. Whoops. Well, that doesn't seem to be working. I don't understand why. We'll try that later. Okay, let's move on. Third issue, government writes a safe case. What's a safe case? A safe case is when the government tries to preempt opposition disadvantages. If topics are chosen well, neither side is obviously the winner. Both sides, has, have, sides have advantages and disadvantages. When the government tries to define or set up a plan to avoid disadvantages, it's writing a safe case, okay? When you do that, you're not embracing the burden that's in the motion. And it's basically similar to the idea, if you've ever heard the term, a tight case, a tight case being an interpretation of the motion which is not arguable. Again, if you go on the APDA website, you look at the novice mentor, they talk about tight cases. The remedy here is when you write a government case, part of your job is to accept the flaws in your position, okay? If you are arguing about life sentences for prisoners, you have to deal with the fact that if you're going to be arguing in favor of life sentences, prison is an unpleasant place to be. And you can't try and, and get away from that fact. You have to justify the unpleasantness with some sort of greater good. You've got to be prepared to defend the disadvantages that adhere to your position. And what you have to do is you have to be ready to compare and contrast them to the advantages of your side. This is essentially what the essence of debate is. How many coaches have you heard say you have to weigh the round? Weighing the round means that your side has good points, but it also has bad points. And if you weigh the round by saying, well, we've shown our side has nothing but good, and we've shown all the bad things they've said don't exist, you're not weighing the round. You haven't accepted the burden of the motion. You have to deal with both of those. This is an extreme example. This house believes that fighting climate change is more important than following the law. These are, case, these are real cases. These are flows from real debates. So their definition is fighting climate change is any action against global warming. And their plan was it only applies to actions with her et ethically justified peaceful protests. Okay, if you're gonna deal with climate change and saying it's more important than, follow it, than following the law, then you have to deal with the issue of violent opposition. You have to deal with the idea that people are gonna do things like sabotage pipelines, they are going to get into protests against police, they're gonna have to deal with violence. To avoid that justification is to avoid it, because basically governments, at least in, in Western democracies, generally permit peaceful protests. Affirmative here is not arguing in favor of anything. This is also sometimes called a squirrel, depending on how extreme it is. You don't have to be this extreme to write your case to avoid, avoid problems. Opposition has a corresponding mistake, and that is failing to adapt. You have all done this, I am certain. During prep time, you were on opposition. 
You spent 15 minutes putting together a case. You worked real hard to put that case together. You are determined when you walk into that room to present that case to the judge. Don't do that. You have a burden on opposition to oppose the motion, but you have a greater burden to oppose the motion as interpreted by the government team. If you do not oppose the government case, if you simply present the opposition case you wanted to, to, a, to pre present, then you're failing in your burden on opposition and you are likely going to lose the round. Oops. The job of the leader of the opposition is to listen carefully and adapt the opposition case during the prime minister constructed. You may simply have to reword your contentions. Sometimes you may have to junk your entire case. You may have to toss it out and during those seven minutes, you may have to write an entirely new opposition case. You have to make sure when you present your opposition case, you preface it with reference to the government case. Why does your opposition contest the government case, not simply contest the resolution. Your job is to beat the other team, not to beat the motion. On opposition, the most important thing to remember is you have no case until you've heard the PMC. And that's what makes opposition, the leader of the opposition speech challenging. How during those seven minutes, do you shift your case or possibly write a new one so that you answer the burden of the debate? You reply to the government team. Okay, fifth mistake. You've all been told you've got to cover the flow, okay? Failing to cover happens all the time. And I see it in preliminary rounds. I see it in novice. I see it in varsity. I see it in final rounds in varsity at top tournaments. Every constructive speech should cover every argument outstanding. You should write that down. You should take it to heart. I learned how to debate well when a kind judge who was the coach of an opposing team sat down with my partner and I after they judged us in the debate and walked us through a flow and explained this to us. Cover every argument. Even if your answer isn't a good one, make sure you cover it. If your opponent has dropped an argument, mention that. Remind the judge. Don't drop it yourself, okay? You don't have to give the full reply again. You just have to remind the judge, hey, we made this argument. They didn't say anything. Please carry that through. If the argument is flawed, you note the flaw, explain why it's flawed, and then move on quickly. Always use your strongest answer first. If you've got five answers to an argument, it doesn't make any sense to give all five answers if you fail to cover another argument. Use the best one and save the other answers for later in the debate. Maybe your partner can use them. And watch your time. Okay. The simplest way, and, and I use this when I teach debate, is the contentions are your friend. If in every constructive speech you go through every government contention and every opposition contention, you will have given a good constructive speech. It's better if you can match the contentions up. In other words, if the second opposition contention goes directly against the first government contention. If you match those up, that's better, but you don't necessarily have to do that. And if you can reorganize the debate by issues, if it's clear that the issues in the debate are not best given by the contentions, they are given by, for example, maybe equity is the primary issue, maybe um, cost is a secondary issue. If you can reorganize by that, that's kind of the best way to organize it. But make sure you cover all of them. Also, if you reorganize, stick with your reorganization. Your partner has to go along with it. 
one thing, this only applies to the constructive speeches. Rebuttals should summarize the round. Rebuttals should identify the issues. Rebuttals should weigh, compare, and contrast. In particular, do not summarize the debate in the constructive speeches. That's what the rebuttals are for. Very often, I'll see the member of opposition constructive. They'll go through a few of the contentions, and then they'll say, now let me summarize the voting issues. Don't do that. Member of opposition constructive should make sure you hammer every single contention, every argument that's been made, so it's clear the opposition wins that argument. Leader of the opposition rebuttal then has a clear slate, and they can do nothing but summarize the round and weigh in your favor. Okay, why don't you fail to cover? Why do you fail to cover? Generally, it's because of time misallocation. You're not paying attention to the clock. Debate is about words. Debate is about limited amount of speaking time. If you're not watching the clock, if you do not have a plan for how long it's going to take you to answer each argument, you're going to miss, you're going to drop. When do you misallocate time? You spend too much time on one contention or one issue. You spend too much time on your strongest argument. You spent too much time on the argument you are most familiar with and most comfortable with. If you're comfortable with an argument, stop spending time on it. Move to the arguments you're not comfortable with. You spend too much time on the first argument you make, and you forget to get to the others. Again, if you've got five subpoints, don't use five subpoints. Use three, save the others for your next year partner. Often you will spend too much time on your own case. Why? Because you're familiar with your own case. The member of government will get up and they will spend most of their time talking about the government case. Leader of the opposition or member of the opposition will spend most of their time talking about the opposition contentions. You win debates by talking about your opponent's case. You do not win debates talking about your own case. Always remember that. Debate is about answering the other team, not about talking about your own case. How do you avoid this? Put benchmarks on your outline. When you sit there and you're working on your flow and you're outlining your speech, if you have five contentions to get through, three on government, two on opposition, and you've got an eight-minute constructive, eight divided by five is about a minute and a half. If you are not moving through each contention every minute and a half, you're going to run out of time. Now, yes, it may be clear some contentions are more important or some contentions are more complicated and, and deserve more time, in which case maybe you break that rule a little. But the starting point is equal time for all contentions and then adjust from there. Use the strongest arguments first, but pay attention to the clock. You've got that cell phone in front of you. You're running a timer. Make sure your screen doesn't go blank and make sure you check it every once in a while next to your flow. Where am I supposed to be? This is an example. This is an NYPDL final round from last debater, last December. Standard flow. Can you see my, my mouse on this in the, uh, in the display? Does it show my mouse? Okay. Yeah. So standard flow, government case, opposition arguments towards the bottom. So when the opposition presents its case down here, Look at the white space. Government's got five contentions. Opposition spends six minutes, 20 seconds presenting their case. They get to the first government contention and they drop everything else. But then opposition, and again, this is a final round, final varsity round. Opposition gets in there and the member of, the op the member of government constructive drops all of their own case. The member of the op government constructive does not talk about the government case, does not remind the judge that Gov has dropped the arguments and just spends their entire time talking about the opposition case. These are good debaters. These are actually kids I coach. 
It happens. You're going to do this. You have done this. Okay, six, quibbling. The dictionary definition of quibbling, it's an evasion or a minor objection, trying to evade an argument. I'll extend that. Anything you say or do that does not advance your case or add to the debate, make the debate better. And there are lots and lots of quibbling that you can do. Quibbling, by the way, is not a, a game out of, uh, out of Harry Potter. Okay, the biggest area that people quibble about is over definitions. Okay, how do you quibble over definitions? You define terms that don't matter. You argue over terms that don't matter. You present an alternative definition. The government defines a term one day, you, one way you get up on opposition and you say, we'd like to redefine that term. But then you don't use that definition to make an argument. You present definitions, alternatives to no pur purpose. Very often the hint is, I just like to clarify this term. Why are you clarifying that term? Okay, if on opposition, the government makes a definition that you don't like, unless it changes an argument, it doesn't matter. So if you stand up and you redefine a term, then you had better have a reason for it. You had better have an argument that depends on changing the definition. You better have an argument that says, if we let the government define the term this way, it will hurt our case. And here's why it will hurt the case. Otherwise, unless you can show the government, dis at government definition disadvantages you, then you should let the debate proceed with their definitions. <coughs> Otherwise, you are probably wasting time. Now, I am definitely not saying definitions are not important. And very often, if you listen closely, you will hear something in the government definitions that are critical to the debate. So you need to have a very good ear here. But most of the time when I hear opposition argue over definitions, they did not hear what I heard, and their redefinition is not important to the round. The other thing is sometimes a bad definition can be a gift. This was a, a debate from several years ago. Student loans should be limited to those students and amounts that are highly likely to be paid in full. The idea was to argue about the student loan crisis. The definition and the flaw here was they defined student loans, they limited it to graduate students. Now, is that a reasonable limit on the debate? You can argue no, because most student loans have to do with undergraduates, not graduate students. On the other hand, it turns out that this definition is actually a gift to the opposing team. Number one, graduate students generally should be in graduate school. The problem with the student loan crisis is that many people go to college, borrow a lot of money, with no idea as to what they expect to do when they get out, and in particular, how they're going to repay the money. Graduate students have generally chosen a career. The second thing is, is that if you don't let money, lend money to undergraduates, you probably simply remove a number of students who really shouldn't be there. On the other hand, graduate students are in short supply. And many of the most important skills we need are taught to a graduate students who are undergoing advanced training. How do you replace them? So by accepting this definition, you basically can say, we really think this is potentially unfair because graduate students are not the main problem. But we thank the government team because here's how it gives them a very weak case and how we're going to win the debate. So think about that. Okay, other forms of quibbling. Any questions, by the way? I tend to be a debater and I just keep talking. He said, she said. The opposing speaker makes a statement that is obviously a misstatement. They say yes instead of no. They forget to include a not in a sentence. 
don't hold them to it. You know what they were trying to say. Make your argument based on the fairest interpretation of the other case. Don't take a slip of the tongue and use it against them. Don't quote the rules of debate. There are no rules of debate. And even that rule isn't a rule because the timing of the speeches are a rule of debate that is actually enforced. As Captain Barbarossa says in Pirates of the Caribbean about the code of the pirates, they're more guidelines than actual rules. Make an argument. If your opponent is doing something you think violates what you've been told is a rule of debate, explain why it disadvantages you. Explain why it is a bad argument. That's why the rules you've been given are there. They're there to make sure you have a good debate. They're make sh there to make sure it's fair to both sides. Explain why what they're doing is bad. Don't simply say, well, they can't do it. It's against the rules. Okay, avoiding the question. When you get a POI, answer it directly. It's obvious when you waffle the answer. It's also obvious if they've got a question that nails you dead to rights, the judge sees that, the audience sees that, everybody sees it. Answer the question, give a short answer. If what they ask is true, don't, just because it supports their case, don't worry about it. You know, is it true that jail is a bad place to be and that all prisoners are harmed by it? Yes, that's a true statement. You can explain that answer later and balance it against why you would keep certain people in jail. They're not there because they were good people. Don't avoid the question. Very often I'll hear debaters say, could you repeat that? Or I don't understand. It's your job to understand. It's your job to answer it. If you truly didn't hear it, that's one thing. But if you're just saying this in order to give yourself time to think, don't do it. Train yourself to answer the question right away and move on. Don't badger or be badgered. Don't ever insist on a yes or no answer. Ask the question. Let the, it, this is, is, applies probably more to cross, cross X where you can follow up. But when you get a good point in, let them answer it. They're going to deal with it. It'll work in your favor. Arguing outside the round. I often see this. Don't argue when a judge is giving you a critique. Listen, your job is basically to understand the judge's thinking. You don't have to like what the judge is saying. You don't have to agree with what the judge is saying. You can feel that the, the judge is a complete idiot. That's fine. I have, every debater has stories about judges who have grossly, unfairly decided against them. Your job is to listen closely, figure out what that judge saw that you didn't, so that the next time you see that judge or a judge like that, you can win the round. Your job is to seek understanding. You can ask informational questions, ask the judge to explain, but do it in a friendly way. Don't do it in a challenging way. It's not a debate. It's simply to learn what the judge's thinking was about. And finally, don't confront the judge or the opponents. If you think they have done something that is out of bounds, if you feel there is an equity violation or something like that, don't get into a fight with them. That's what you take back to your coach. Talk it over with your coach and then decide whether or not to pursue it from there. Okay, seven, lack of clarity. Debate is spoken word. Debate is presenting arguments verbally. It's very hard to do that unless you are crystal clear. Learning to be a good debater is learning clarity, learning clarity of thought, learning clarity of presentation. How are the ways that you can be unclear? Well, confusion about your own case, bad wording. How many times have you seen a debater say, my first contention is equity? That's not a contention, that's a tagline. Every contention should be a full sentence, not a long sentence, but a full sentence that gives you a complete thought. Once you present that sentence, you can say, 
we feel that prison sentences are unfair to the poor population because they get bad legal representation. We're going to refer to this as our equity contention. Contentions that don't help you. Arguing the obvious. If something is obvious, you don't have to present an argument. If it's a debate about global warming, you can stand up and say, I think we can all agree global warming, climate change is a problem. If the opposition wishes to contest that, we'll happily answer their objections and then move on. You do not have to spend three minutes explaining global warming is a problem. Arguments that don't justify the motion. Okay, if the argument is true, regardless of whether the motion is adopted or not, it doesn't matter. You can simply state it and move on. A particular form of this, and it refers back to the idea of global warming, is talking about harms rather than solvency or uniqueness. Harms are easy. Debate motions are chosen because there's a problem. If you spend a lot of time explaining the problem, you are wasting time. Most of the time, you can simply assume the problem. The hard part is showing that adopting the motion solves the problem and that the status quo cannot, that the advantages are unique. That's where you need to spend your time. Failure to identify voting issues. What is it you have to win in order to win the debate? And this goes back to what I started with, the idea of finding the central issue, not ordering by strength. If you present weak arguments first, people are going to wonder what your case is about and missing the linkages between contentions. We'll see a little bit more about that a little bit further on. Okay, inconsistency, confusing the judge, disagreeing with your partner. When your partner stands up and says something, you are stuck with it, okay? You can clarify a clear misstatement, but other than that, if your partner decides to go in a particular direction, you've got to follow. If your partner jumps off a cliff, the best thing you can do is, is hope that, that you're going to have a soft landing and jump off a cliff too. Presenting your contentions in different order. There are any number of times when I have seen two debaters stand up and the first member of the team will present three contentions and the second member will present those same three contentions in a different order or will present three contentions but the wording will be different. Don't do that. One of the things you should come out of the prep time with is you should have a piece of paper with your contentions written out in full. Every time you state your contention, state it exactly the same way. If you've got three contentions, four contentions, always present them in the same order. Don't confuse the judge. If your partner makes a mistake, adapt to it. Don't get upset. You win or lose as a team. You don't win or lose as an individual. That's why having a plan ahead of time, getting to know your partner, understanding how you're going to deal with situations before you get into the round is important. How do you deal with these things? Okay, misunderstanding your opponent, okay? It's your job to listen carefully. If you ask a POI of the sort, could you repeat your second contention? Everybody in the room knows you weren't paying attention. That's not good. If you have to do that at the very least, state, is your second contention and then give a phrasing of it so they can correct you if you're wrong. But generally, a POI like that is a waste of time. It shows you're not listening. We talked about this early, earlier. When your opponent makes an argument, reply to the best version of that argument you can think of. Don't turn it into a, tin, a, a straw man. Don't weaken it by misinterpreting it. And incorrectly assessing the strength or the leakage. Don't say things like they didn't prove. Give the judge the analysis. They said this, but in order to show that, they need to have told you this. And here's what we've said that refutes it. 
Give the complete answer. Don't simply say they didn't prove something. It's a meaningless statement. Complexity is not your friend. You will see debaters that do the following. We have three contentions. My first contention is I have four subpoints. My first subpoint is under the first subpoint, I have two points. Okay. I have never in 25 years of judging see a debater successfully go through a complicated tree structure like this without getting confused, without failing to signpost which contention and which subpoint and which sub subpoint they were in. Don't do this. Once you get beyond subpoints in a contention, you've gone too far. If your contention has five subpoints, it has too many. Rethink it. Remember, the judge is listening to your words. The judge is not looking at your outline. And if that outline is complicated, the judge is not going to get it down on their flow, even if they're a very good judge with a lot of experience. Okay, asserting. Every one of you who's ever taken an English course has had a teacher tell you when you write, show, don't tell. Don't simply assert that's wrong. Give the reasons why it's wrong. Don't simply say, we answered that contention. If you're going to say, we answered that contention, remind the judge how you answered that argument or contention. Don't quote the rules. Say, they did this, that's bad because. Here's my argument why they shouldn't do that. If you present data or you present examples without any background, do not assume the judge is familiar. Ryan, who's presenting his um, um, lecture on humor while we're listening, I listened to him in a debate talk about the Overton window. I've been around for a very long time. I had never heard of the Overton window before. I looked it up after the debate. I now know what it is. But he just assumed everybody in the room knew what the Overton window was and based arguments on it. That's not going to help you if the judge doesn't know what you're talking about. In one of the final rounds in the TOC, I heard it was on a single-payer health care system. One team in favor told me that single-payer health care was going to save $10 trillion over 10 years. The other team quoted a source. This is West Coast, so they could use the Internet saying that single-payer health care was going to cost $30 trillion over 10 years. Turns out both of them were quoting exactly the same source. None of them told me what those numbers meant or where they came from. Confusing. No explanation. If you present a fact, it needs an explanation. It needs a warrant. It needs a link. It needs causality. Facts can be explained in many ways. If your opponent presents a fact without an explanation, take that fact and re-explain it in your favor. Good way to win around. And don't answer with jargon. When you say something like cross-apply my previous argument or just carry the argument across the flow or we turn the link on that contention. You are assuming the judge is looking at your flow. You don't know what previous argument the judge is going to apply or if the judge even knows what the previous argument is. You don't know that the judge has anything to carry across the flow. You don't know that the judge sees the same link that you saw. Don't do this. This jargon is not an argument. It's not clear. It's an assertion. Okay, getting close to the end. No follow-up after the round. One of the worst things I see is when I go in, a, in an in-person debate tournament and I see some debater's notes either in a trash can or worse, just simply lying on the ground discarded. Okay? Your flow is the only reliable record you have of the debate, okay? 
if you're lucky, the judge gives you a good RFD, but that RFD is not a complete flow of the round. The most important thing, the reason that I became a good debater, the reason that that kindly coach could sit down and take us through the round he just judged is because my partner and I had a good flow of the round and he could show us what he needed to show by looking at our notes. If he'd done it with his own notes, it would have been nothing to us because we wouldn't have been able to relate to it. Flow your own speeches. Another thing I see is you get to the rebuttals. The prime minister is giving a rebuttal and his partner is sitting there just listening. Don't do that. What your partner meant to say and what your partner actually says could be two different things. Flow the rebuttals. Flow your own speeches or have your partner flow your speeches. When you go home after the tournament, you should have a post-mortem. You should have a debrief. Go over every round. Go over each argument. Which arguments could be better? Which arguments did you win? Why did you win them? Which ones did you lose? Look up anything you don't know. If a debater says something and you do not understand it, look it up. If you have me as a judge and you say something you don't, I don't know, First of all, that's pretty hard to do because I've been around the circuit for a long time. But secondly, the first thing I'm going to do when I get out of there is I'm going to go to Wikipedia and I'm going to find your reference. I'm going to find what it was you were talking about. So the next time I know what it was. You should do the same thing. And this should be true throughout life. You should never walk out of a classroom not understanding something a teacher has said. If a teacher says something you don't understand, raise your hand or make a note of it. Spend the time afterwards to get it down. It's extremely important in college because nobody's going to care if you flunk that course in college. If you don't know something, it's going to be your fault. In high school, your teachers are looking out for you. The older you get, the less likely that is. You need to revise and improve, okay? Churchill said, to improve is to change, to be perfect is to change often. Again, when I started out, debaters seem to just do the same thing over and over again. Don't do that. Observe your own behavior. Study it as if you were watching yourself from the outside and find ways to improve it. Finally, too little time on debate. I hate sports metaphors because I think sports are overemphasized in our culture. But look, if you were on a tennis team, if you were on the football team, if you were on the soccer team, you probably have a three-hour practice five days a week after school. And each season is about one quarter long, about 13 weeks. That's 195 hours. 195 hours is one hour per school day and Saturday for the entire school year. How much time do you spend on debate? I can assure you the kids who are really good at this are spending more time on debate than you are. If this is your primary activity, if this is important to you, if you're not spending at least an hour a day on debate or debate-related activities, how good do you, can you expect to get? Do you follow the news? Do you read nonfiction books outside of school? Do you practice speaking? And the hint here is, why don't you just read aloud? If you have books to read for English, every day spend five or 10 minutes reading aloud, practice, exercise your voice. Do you practice taking notes when you sit in a classroom? Do you take notes while the teacher talks? Get into the habit. Again, this becomes more important in college. Taking good notes is an extremely useful skill to have. Do you case motions? You can go back on the NYPDL website. You can go back on the NPDL website. You can go over a motion a day. And you have an advantage that I didn't have as a young debater in that there are videos posted. The National Parliamentary Debate League now has an excellent source of, of rounds from the, the past couple of years. NYPDL is posting debate rounds. 
you can sit down, you can practice flowing, you can listen, you can listen to arguments, you can analyze. If you do one debate a week, one video a week, that's 50 rounds of practice. If you do one a day, that's a couple hundred, okay? As a judge, I judge 60 rounds or so a year. How many debates are you in in a year? Again, practice makes a big difference. I don't know if you're into debate texts. You can find these in PDF, but absolutely the best debate text I have ever read is Simon Quinn's Debating in the World School Style. World School Style is a three-on-three -three variant of parliamentary debate. It's World School's format. Um, it's becoming more popular in the US. Don't worry about that. Most of the book is about writing cases and building arguments and answering them. This guy was a world champion debater and this is the only debate textbook I have ever read that sounds like it was written by some guy who debated and knew how to win. So I highly recommend it. More traditionally, John Meany and Kate Schuster, these two books are available. And again, you can find them in PDF format. You can send them to your Kindle and read them at the beach if you want. Um, read a debate textbook, get some ideas, learn some structure for some, from some other people. So I'll leave you with the old joke. Presumably you've heard it before. Tourist walks up to a policeman in New York and says, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? What's the answer the policeman gives him? You've never heard this? Tremend terribly old joke. Practice. Debate is about spending time. It's about paying attention. It's about reviewing your performance. It's about getting better at things. Any questions?